direct from the web, it's Billy Masters Live. And now, please welcome your host, Billy Masters. everyone, welcome to Billy Masters Live. I am, of course, your host, Billy Masters, and today, oh, thank you, Monica. Uh, it's two, this is a rare Tuesday show. Tuesday, June 28th, 29th, I can't see. You know, Nana's old, Nana needs her glasses. You know, every once in a while, you'll see the glasses come on just so I can see what's going on. God, it's a very good hair day. Anyway, you know, it wasn't as good till I could see. Anyway, it's June 29th, 2021, and we're doing a rare Tuesday show for a very special reason. Um, I've been talking about doing a show with my friends from The Real World New York, the first season, the best season of The Real World, because they had a special reunion series this past year on MTV. Actually, it started on MTV. This one was on Paramount+. Plus which made it really difficult to watch. Can I just say that? So if those of you who didn't watch it, you know, I think Paramount Plus, you can add on or pay or something. The first episode was online for free on YouTube. And there's six, I think six episodes, and they're really good. But anyway, so I wanted to get this show in during Pride Month, hence the Tuesday show. Programming note, because I know those of you are going to ask, I think I'm taking two weeks off. You know, I'm exhausted. Um, and I'm going to Provincetown this weekend. And, you know, I don't want to rush back and work. So there will still be new columns uh, every week, obviously, on BillyMasters.com. And if you want to watch any of our previous shows, and we are now up to... 97 shows. This is the 97th show, and you wonder why I'm tired. So if you go to billymasters.com slash TV, here's a tip. You can also just go to billymasters.tv. But I don't say that because it gets people confused. Anyway, if you go to billymasters.com slash TV, you'll find it. Or go to our YouTube channel, Billy Masters TV, and you can watch all of the old shows for free. We don't charge you for anything. So this is why I'm tired and poor. But uh, be that as it may, I live to serve. And um, this is really, this show today has been a long time coming. Um, Norman Corpy was, you know, I don't want to say the first gay person on, on television and not even the first gay person on reality television, but certainly for my generation was a trailblazer in really showing the world a gay man who was just starting to make his way in the world. And with the cast of The Real World, we got to see a little bit of ourselves and a little bit of other people our age. And for those of you who don't remember The Real World, there they are. And there they are. And then they came back this year Look at that. So um, uh, we have two of the people who are on the show, and both of them kind of icons in the gay community, Norman Corpy, for being really openly gay and owning his sexuality, and um, Eric Nice for basically being the one we all want to sleep with. But actually, that's not all he had to offer, although there was an awful lot there to offer. Look, just look, look. But also, really smart, really interesting, and also really great conversations on that show, the old one and the new one, that um, kind of were precursors for all of us having conversations. So normally, I talk to each person individually for like 20 minutes, but I think I really want to talk to them both together. So I'm going to bring them both on from his home, we have Norman Corpy. Hey, hey Norman. Billy. How are you doing? Are you, where are you? I'm in Ironwood, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So that's the UP. All right. <laughs> Everyone's we like, what is that shape? That. Yeah, up there. we will talk about that. Mm. And, uh, and coming to us all the way from Peru, making this show very international, Eric Nice. Hi, Eric. Hi, Billy. Can you Hi, hear Norm. me? Hey, there you are. Hey. 
Where in Peru are you, Eric? I am in the Sacred Valley in a uh, town called Pisac, about halfway okay. in between Cusco and Machu Picchu. And I know that you're really into healing and getting back to the earth and new age stuff. So what are you down there specifically for? Uh, I came down here, I was hosting uh, an ayahuasca retreat with a, a group of about 12 uh, people. And that went on for about eight weeks. And so we finished that up and I decided... Uh, to stay and uh, organize another retreat at the end of July that I opened up to the public for the first time. Cool. And uh, if people want information, is there a website where they can get it? Um, my work is, you know, my personal website is Um But mm -hmm. the information for the retreat is on my Instagram and my Facebook page. Okay, cool. Uh, we will post it, but just so people know, there's your website so they can uh, get more information there. So, Thank you. Uh, and uh, Norman, you're in Michigan, and people who watch The Real World, I think they were really surprised to see how your life has turned around mm -hmm. and turned and turned and turned. So since we saw you 28 years ago, you were an artist, mostly a commercial artist, I guess, when you started, or you were working with various media. And when I knew you in L.A., you were also still doing that. But things have turned for you. What happened recently? Well, um, recently, I mean, I, and I, I do miss Los Angeles, and I do have a lot of my possessions still scattered about <laughs> um, there. And I'm very fortunate to have made really good friends that have my stuff, but it's only going to be so long they're going to put up with my stuff in their garage. Is um, it still in Janet's garage? You were friend. You were staying. Janet, like, yeah, oh, Janet's Janet still. I, yeah, I was. I was. I was living in Janet Charlton's guest house, and um, and I had an art studio um there, um, and then it just you know uh, just work absolutely everything came to a screeching halt, and I thought COVID was like okay here's, you know three weeks um. And being somewhat independent, it's kind of hard to get unemployment. <laughs> you know, you try yeah. to go through the whole thing. And it's just like, oh, photographers, artists, I don't know how that works to help. Um, so just literally my funds were just draining up. Um, I work in the entertainment business a lot. So I was doing also movie sets. I'll do set decoration, you know, odd things that would come along. Um, just enough work to then do another art show. So that was kind of like how I've been living for the last several years. And when the movie industry also shut down pretty hard, there just wasn't um, a lot of opportunity. So um, I just kind of watched the whole bank account draining away. And, you know, Janet's only generous so far. And she's just like, well, I <laughs> that lady, she likes her coins. So she, she does. She, she's, she's a lady. She needs that coin. Well, you know, and, and I felt bad with Janet, too, because you know how much she rents that house out. For movie shoots there isn't yeah, anything absolutely. i mean so it was very difficult on her also so i you know it was i mean she, she's she was struggling so it wasn't you know i'm not trying to make a bad thing worse there but right ultimately Wait, was, was it family in michigan uh, yes my family is from michigan and um at the time my father needed a shoulder replacement and my mother has okay. also kind of started to lose some of her eyesight and hearing so um I was like, well, I might as well just quarantine with them and I'll just move back home because I, you know, only have about three more like weeks left of just basically, I just have enough money to drive my car, <laughs> you know, to Michigan. And then I can like, at least go back to my bedroom and, you know, from like 50 years ago. <laughs> um, and that is where I am as well. So I, totally get it. So I was no just judgment. Like, yeah. So I was just like, oh man. Um, and they just needed help. And my cousins uh, have a, a small hometown bakery here and some other yeah. cousins. And I just started picking up some just work wherever. A lot of people were very uncomfortable working in the pandemic. And my cousins, it was just pretty much family. And it was just takeout. So we just literally, you know, the vaccines weren't there. And so I started picking up just some work and just kind of digging in. And then the snow came. And uh, here I was. Um, I 
I thought Eric called me about this reunion thing, and I thought he was joking because I rarely hear from Eric and Kevin, and they're like, "Hey, they want to put this <laughs> thing together, right?" Like it was like Christmas time on COVID, and I'm like, how how is this going to even happen? But I was, you know, absolutely thankful for the opportunity and um, the chance to to see everybody again, and uh, lo and behold, um, you know. It re jump started my painting career. I know it really, you know. How long had it been since you had actually worked as an artist? Had you really put it on the back burner? Well, I did. You know, I was showing work. There's a, I don't know if you're familiar with Blackman Cruise. They're um, mm -hmm. yeah. on, uh, yeah, so they're over on Highland. And so I've been somewhat successful with them. And, um, but, you know, everything just kind of grinded down. And, you know, when you're working with several galleries, you know, they're closing down too. And, you know, they only get an, you get an opportunity like once a year to show to gallery, you know, so you got to try to right. find other galleries. So all of a sudden everyone's being thrown out of the mix. So all these shows that are coming up are, I mean, I'm not being able to even get into doing an art show to even figure out how to exhibit my work. <laughs> yeah. Everything was backed up for like a year. And so yeah. things that I had a friend in New York who was working in an art, who's an art dealer and his gallery was closed and he was a high level person. And he's now working on those tourist cruise ships around New York. Harbor know, right? you gotta you do. need to do what you do. You gotta, you gotta do. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, Eric, now you, I remember on Real World, you were from, was it New Jersey originally? Yeah, Jersey Shore, Ocean Township, New Jersey. So going into uh, pr just prior to this Real World reunion, where were you? What were you doing? Uh, I was in California at the time, just uh, uh -huh. working with clients. Yeah. And um and so as uh Norman just said, you called him. Was did this whole reunion idea was this an idea you had was an idea the producers had? How did it come about, Eric? Oh no. Uh MTV um was not doing well in the Do we lose decided it? that they hmm. they wanted to repurpose um you know some of their old content and mm -hmm. so this was um a, a way for them to kind of get back in in the game and 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 be competitors in the in the streaming world and also remind people that they were the first which i think is really important to remember that you guys were pioneers although wasn't there another season of real world that had done a homecoming previous to you guys I'm not aware of mm. one like this. Or they may be, yeah, maybe not a full series. Mm. Maybe somebody else had just done specials. But Eric, mm, how yeah. ironic that, you know, you called Norm to talk about this. And yet, as luck would have it, Eric wasn't really able to participate fully. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, not at all, really. <laughs> you know, so, so my was, understanding uh, virtual from people, participation. Yeah, from people I know who were part of the show, um, you guys all were quarantined in separate hotels. You had no interaction before the show started. And how long were you supposed to be in quarantine before filming? Was it two weeks? It seemed about like eight days. I, I'm, I could be wrong, but I think it was about eight days, at least a week or so. Um, and then... You know, then all of a sudden uh, they said something's we had it. We have to push it back another day. So I guess Eric <laughs> tested positive. So they try to push it back to make sure his test was reading correct. And we're like, oh no! And now we got to be here another day or two. And then like rumors start spreading around. It's like, oh my gosh, Kevin, he just went off to like Jamaica or somewhere. <laughs> and because it was someone that went out of the country, and we're like, oh Kevin, oh he ruined it. So it was a total surprise <laughs> that we, it was Eric. Cause poor Kevin. We're already blaming him before we started That's the all right. Show. We're going to be getting to Kevin. Don't worry about it. Eric, so now what do you remember about the chronology? How did you get the news? Uh, I just, I got a phone call. Well, they, this all kind of, I think, kind of got stirred up, started happening is because he, um mm -hmm. and andy cohen um cohen, yep. they they were doing a 30-year special on the history of reality tv 
And so yep. Norman, Heather, and Julie and I, we all got together for that. And then it was a few weeks after that that we got the call uh, for this. So it, it was something that they had been, you know, discussing that they wanted to do. And they wanted to do it really, really fast. They had a deadline to get it done by a certain amount of time. So everything happened really quickly. And you, now when you were sequestered in the hotel, did you have any idea that you had COVID at that point? No, I was actually feeling pretty good uh, for the first mm -hmm. few days that I was there and like, you know, down, um, <clears throat> like feeling, feeling fine. And then I went to sleep one night and I don't, it's very interesting how it happened because I don't, you know, it's re it was really cold in New York. Um, but I like to sleep with the window open. And so this one night I slept up with the window open and I woke up freezing in the middle of the night, like shaking. And so I thought I, I just got, you know, maybe a fever or something. Um, but it reacted really, really quickly. And I started to get all the symptoms, um, of COVID and I tried to do the best that I could to, you know, knock it out of my body and, um, started juicing and taking all different types of supplements and herbs. Um, but it came on really strong. Um, and then my fever went up and yeah, I had it for, for about uh, two weeks. The most interesting thing about my experience with COVID was that my temperature was going up to like 102.7. Wow. But then throughout the day, it would drop, 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 drop. And that actually got as low as 96.7. So I was like on the verge That's of hyperthermia and, and yeah. temperature was going up. Yeah. And I, and I could feel this. It felt like, like a metal spider from like mm. another planet, <laughs> like crawling mm -hmm. around wow. in my body, trying to find like a weak spot in my immune system to hurt me. It was yeah, very interesting right. observing it for two weeks. Mm. Yeah, there were times during the show that you talked about thinking, oh, I think I'm okay now. And they would test you and everybody in the house would be like, great, this is the day that Eric's coming. And they'd watch the door. It was just so <laughs> dramatic. And they'd say, who's that at the door? And then commercial. And then all of a sudden they'd open the door and it was like, you know, somebody with a pizza. I mean, it was just awful. I know. Well, I, I know. I feel like we're robbed. Somehow, Billy. <laughs> we're robbed. We need another three episodes, Billy. Tell your audience to um, to lobby um, the Paramount Plus people. We need we need at least three more episodes. Well, there's so much rough. to talk. There's, there's too much to talk about. That's the thing. Now, the original Real World, Norman, was how long? The first, uh, the original season. How long were you living in that? I think we we're oh, just around three months, maybe. A, a couple weeks longer than that. It seemed about three months. And it so, got down to what? 10 episodes that first It was one? 13 episodes. Oh, 13. Okay. Yeah. And this was like six episodes over like a week. Or something. Yeah. I know we've improved. We can make television fast no, these days. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think you have because I really felt that this one, first off, you're trying to make a show during COVID. Yeah. So really, hi, what are we doing today? Oh, we're sitting around talking. Oh, good. That's <laughs> fun. I mean, it was, I've seen hostage videos that were more interactive than that. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot going on. Um, um, and that sort of, in a way, Eric, you kind of still seem to be very much organic to the process because you were on the screen. But it's like this show. While, while it would be great to have the, uh, the three of us sitting in one room talking, mm -hmm. we can make do. Right. Um, but I would think, Eric, you must have felt really robbed of an opportunity. Um. No, I didn't feel robbed. I, I felt like <laughs> that it was, uh, it was, <laughs> I felt like it was all divine. It was all, you know, set up that way and like the rest of my life. And, you know, I accepted it and I rolled with it. And I think it was very beneficial, um, you know, for people that watched it that, you know, maybe, you know, in fear of COVID. 
Um, well, that's true. You know, I that think that really, might, it really did personalize yeah, think, COVID for a lot of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I felt like it it was an opportunity for me to approach COVID in a very uh, peaceful, uh, accepting, non-fearful way. And and it worked out because I've I've had a lot of people reach out to me afterwards, um, you know, about, you know, their experience with COVID and, you know, them watching me go through it that helped them uh, to move through it uh, more peacefully. So I think that mm-hmm. it was divine. I mean, I'm, I'm in that world of, of healing and transformation. Um, so I appreciated the opportunity to be able to, to share that experience with, with the world or whoever it was I was watching. Norman, has Eric always been this easygoing? <laughs> I'm I'm saying he's like voted most improved. I mean, he's <laughs> just it's just a, a treat and a wonder to to you know listen to all of, all of his journeys and and he's just so great at being able to um you know translate his experiences into a tangible way that you can really grasp them you know so that's awesome and uh no it's it's absolutely refreshing and i would say like to eric's testimony about you know it was meant to be it was like the real world is like a barometer that's the great uniqueness of the show is that you know as things are happening in real life they're also happening on the show and you have this context you know and it gives the viewers a window into things that help them. I mean, like, you know, I, back in the day, I was, you know, living my life very open and who I was. And that was something that just was not being expressed at the time. And, you know, and as further cast came along, you know, we had Pedro and that was an incredible event. And he lived his life, you know, with that incredible crazy sad pandemic you know and brought people to such great understanding and knowledge and compassion and um awareness and you know with eric you know having this COVID experience it it added uh, an incredible layer and dimension and you know so the show is very unique like that because also the capital was stormed the day that we came in the capital was being stormed and we're just like what is happening in this country you know so you, you you know you have these big dynamics that are outside of our own bubble coming into our bubble. And, and it's, 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 it's great when we have cast members that, that are able to, you know, share that moment with people and, and uh, you know, benefit. Yeah. People. It certainly is a microcosm of what's going on and almost a time capsule of the, the quarantine moment that we all live through. And as you said, I guess if we look back at the real world with Pedro, for instance, mm-hmm. we seem to think that we've come so far, but those of us who are old enough to remember that time, it seems like just yesterday. So it mm-hmm. really is interesting to, um, Consider that. Do you think, Norman, that had that Eric being outside at a hotel kind of was also a um, calming influence for the more combustible moments in the house this season because he was able to be sort of removed and yet still mm. intricately involved with everybody? I, I absolutely think so. I mean, there was, you know, he could add a certain pause because sometimes we would have something happening in the loft and then. Eric would come in and we'd have to stop or catch up and it gave us just a little bit of a respite to, you know, um, reflect on what, you know, what's going on. Who knows if maybe if Eric was in the loft, it could have been more combustible because, you know, you've got everybody talking over each other at once. So that was actually kind of nice in a certain way, because we all do love chatting. How, yeah. How did you feel about that, Eric, when you saw the tension starting? Because there were there was a lot of times that they'd go to your hotel room and you'd seem to have a lot of frustration that this was going on and try to reach out and get people to actually listen rather than react. Was that a difficult situation for you to be in or was is that your role? Yeah, that... Um... That was very interesting for me how it all played out because, you know, for the last 15 years, I've been assisting people, mostly drug addicts, um, you know, with healing and transforming their lives. So my life is about 
listening and conversation and understanding why people behave the way that they behave to give them to help them to understand why they behave the way, the way they behave you know why do they get triggered what emotions what suppressed emotions are being triggered and why are mm. you responding the way that you are so but that what's necessary uh in in assisting people in healing in that way is to be able to be eye to eye with them so i can feel their emotion they can feel my emotion and then i can intuitively uh you know give them some advice on you know how to move through these different issues so not being in the room if i was in the room the conversation would have been much different because really? i would have focused on on the issues of you know i don't want to mention names but you know why it was difficult you can names <laughs> for certain people to re Me yeah, to receive me. you know receive the information that was being shared <clears throat> there was triggering that was going on and there was this emotional reacting that was going on but there was no greater underlying understanding of why that was happening there was just like talking and talking talking on top of each other um so yeah i again I believe that it all happened exactly the way that it was supposed to happen. But if I was in the room, I feel that it, it would have gone in a different direction. Yeah. And not necessarily mm -hmm. better or worse, but different because you mm -hmm. now would have been an active participant in a mm -hmm. way you seem to be, yeah. you know, almost like a mentor or a moderator because you're one of the group, but you still are removed. And also, again, you just have this peaceful, rational, healing kind of quality about how you talk that doesn't get quite as passionately in the middle of it. And that just may be who you are. <laughs> well, um, I, if you know anything about ayahuasca and plant medicine... <laughs> Um, I've, I've participated in more than 150 ayahuasca ceremonies. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, ayahuasca, uh, grandmother ayahuasca, she's a feminine master plant teacher and healer. And so when you sit with her, she shows you your shadow and shows you your fears and your judgments and your insecurities. She shows you the traumas that you've experienced in your life. And she helps you to understand ancestral lineage programming you know behavior patterns that are imprinted onto us by our family members from one generation to the next to the next to the next so the more that you sit with her and you look at yourself and you continue uh you know to find the courage and strength to heal and transform your soul uh you develop a completely different perspective of the world as we see it at face value there's so much mm -hmm. within our subconscious mind and the information that our soul has carried from one lifetime to the next so especially being in the work that that i do um, i'm very interested in understanding why people behave the way that they behave What's the reason? What's the root cause of, of why people behave the way they behave? Um, so, yeah, I, I would have really, um, it would have been wonderful to be able to share that understanding with, you know, my soul family from the real world. You know, we have such a special bond and connection and, you know, what we participated in and created, co-created together has made such a profound impact on the whole world. I mean, you know, as far as entertainment goes and television and also social media, um, you know, what we did had a profound impact on the way that people communicate and interact mm -hmm. with each other with technology. Um, so, and understand. You know, it's, it's just I mean, a, I really, really, I I think that it also helped with understanding different people that when you thrust people from different backgrounds mm -hmm. into a situation, it <clears throat> is 
So you sort of are forced to deal with issues that mm. perhaps are in the ethos that you don't even know you are mm. holding on to. And um, Norman, it seemed mm -hmm. to me, um, you know, part of me wants to say that mm. you are sort of the little bit of the stirrer in situations. But in this situation, <laughs> which is specifically, <laughs> yep, exactly, between... Um, <laughs> Becky and Kevin, particularly, I felt horrible for you mm. because while I felt that at a certain point you kind of put yourself in the middle by trying to get people to listen to the other one, you also got caught in the crossfire. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a horribly uncomfortable thing to watch. And I can't imagine it was any better being in it. So, um... How did you feel in the moment when you kind of lost it and told Becky to shut up and listen? Which is I know. not what you said. I mean, but it I, is what and this said. is where I, you know, could appreciate Eric more with his calmness, but, you know, I, <laughs> my, you know, Sicilian, uh, you know, only goes so far. And, um, and I, you know, I, I did, I really felt, you know, kind of awful and and there was so much pressure going on you know i mean obviously we were coming into this this situation with the capital being stormed you know with black lives matter kind of happening you know and just kind of being very apparent of just the shoes that we've walked over 30 years i mean kevin's journey was not an easy one i mean he was speaking truth and nobody was listening you know for so many 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 years and it went on and on. And that poor guy took it in the chin, like publicly, you know, he's like, oh, you're the angry black man. You're the angry black man. And I heard that so many times, you know, even with myself as we were changing, people were like, oh, you know, and he was correct. I mean, people see black people in our communities very differently, you know? And um, so what he was addressing during the show was happening right here in Minneapolis and all over the place. So I, I just really felt he was very in a good, calm place. And unfortunately, um, the conversation was just going where it was just so personal all of a sudden that it just, people weren't hearing themselves and it was just getting nowhere. And it was really sad and, and frustrating. And I, I just, I just felt like we have to stop this. I wish I could have said something like, I think it's time for tea and let's put a pin <laughs> on this. And, you know, let's just do a quick break here, folks. You know, I was just like. Yeah, perhaps Eric could have done that. Who, by the way, we yeah. lost, but he'll be coming back, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I felt very torn watching it because um, I have been, you know, again, you and I are gay men. And mm -hmm. so we've been on the side of being marginalized, not like black people, but certainly mm -hmm. in a minority. And on the other hand, we're also white. Right. And so we, I, I understood what both of them were saying, but of course I, and I'm also not a woman. And yeah. it seemed like there was some mansplaining going on to Becky, which was unfortunate. Right. And I had a situation when this, at the same time that I was watching The Real World, where the Meghan Markle interview had aired with Oprah. And mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends who are black. And I mm -hmm. said to them, if I say I don't believe anything Meghan Markle says, does that mean I'm racist? And they said, no, you can have a problem with one person and mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that it's a global thing. And I think right. it started getting very... Um, umbrella like people were putting kevin under the umbrella of all black men mm -hmm. and becky was under the umbrella of all white women and i'm mm -hmm. like or they're just people and I they know. can have an opinion about one or the other and from what i saw i have to say right. i don't think that kevin is an angry black man he is what he's done with his mm -hmm. writing and motivational speaking right. is extraordinary and i also don't believe that becky is racist. I think no. she's privileged like you and I are, mm -hmm. but I think she actually has empathy, but she, but sometimes that's not enough in those conversations. Right. I, 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 you know, I, I wish it could have been a, a way to resolve that maybe in the future, but you know, yeah. I know that everyone, you know, we feel no ill will against each other. We know what, 
go, you know, we know what this process is and we know what happens with the editing and when the TV and the whole thing. So it's, it's a big thing. You know, I've always told Becky, if she ever wants to talk or she needs whatever, my phone is always here and available. And, you know, if she needs like distance and space or whatever she needs, you know, and, you know, and so. Did you feel, uh, Norman, did you feel because you were in the house, did you feel that what we saw on the show was reflective of what you actually lived through in the house? Or was it skewed in a certain way With to maybe make us feel, yeah, to make us feel that either it was more combustible or Becky was worse or Kevin was worse or was that how it went? I, you know, it, it went on much longer. Like, really? I, you know, as, as far as me stepping in, it seemed like there was at least another 20 minutes of that going on. So it seemed oh, like, wow. I know. So that was like, it was much, in my mind, it was a much longer space. It was going on and going on and going on. And it was like a tennis match that just was not, you know, ending right there. Um, and so, you know, in a sense, it was, it's a little shorter than what was, <laughs> was right. being seen. Eric, while you were watching this Kevin Becky thing going on, where it seems if I were on the outside, which I was watching it, that I'm able to hear both people's points of view, and it kind of gets frustrating that the other one isn't hearing it. Did you have the same frustration in your hotel room watching it? <laughs> um, no, I I wasn't frustrated at all. Like I said, I mean, I I have an understanding of, of why Kevin respond, was responding the way he was. And I have an mm -hmm. understanding of why Becky was responding the way she was. So, you know, I, I don't I didn't feel triggered by it. It wasn't causing any kind of emotion inside of me. I think the only thing that I was feeling is that, like I said before, I wish that I was in the room to be mm -hmm. able to have a conversation with them and talk about it. Um, you know, we, we all have our issues, but nobody <laughs> on the planet gets a pass on, you know, the issues that we have to deal with within our, ourselves because of the things that we've experienced in our life. So I have this understanding that we all carry around suppressed emotions from mm -hmm. emotional traumatic experiences that, that have happened to us in our life. And, you know, Kevin's life has been very traumatic and right. the same, you know, with Becky. So the question is, you know, how are you processing uh, those emotions and, and how are they mm -hmm. being projected out into the world? I thought that on both sides, uh, mm -hmm. the, the conversation could have been handled uh, much more gently, much more <laughs> compassionately and much more empathetically. Um, you know, there was a lot of defensive um, response, responding going on. Uh, and I believe that is, you know, from both of their personal experiences in their life that have not been resolved. Right. I absolutely agree with you. I, uh, I really, there were, it, it's, it's so interesting when you watch somebody else's argument and somebody can say something and you're like, oh, that's a really good point. I'm on your side. And then someone else says something, you're like, that is equally a good point. Now I'm on your side. So, um, and I think well, that when you're that, in the isn't middle of it. that the biggest of it, problem of all? <laughs> yeah, that right is yeah, that. But, I know, think Billy, when you're in the middle the of it. the biggest problem of all is that, yeah, we pick sides. Yep. Yeah, that's but, the well, problem. absolutely. That and is I the think problem. That, <laughs> and I think that, you know, I think one of the geniuses of editing, if there is a genius of editing, is that it can make you identify with either side at the same time. Um, but Norman, you had a mm -hmm. really difficult situation in the sense that you and Becky had been incredibly close up until you went into the house. <laughs> And suddenly you were the one being iced out and not and really kind of at least seen by her from how it was projected as mm -hmm. the villain. Why weren't you there for me? Why did you turn on me? And that was really awkward to watch. How did that feel? 
Well, I mean, I was, I honestly, I was very surprised and taken aback when um, she had her bags packed and she was <laughs> headed for the door. Like that, yeah. like it, that happened so quickly. She, cause she just got up kind of like, uh, you know, like she was going to make some tea and she was kind of like, look, seemed like she was kind of cool. And, um, you know, and, and then I, when she was like going, I just, I, you know, I just thought like, okay, me saying shut up was probably, I just took that very personally and I should have carried that far. So I went and talked to her outside. I was like, you know, I'm really, you know, I'm sorry here. Is this, you know, is a re result of me saying these things, you know, I mean, you, and I told her if you want to throw a pie in my face or something, you know, just kind of <laughs> bring some humor here. Um, but, you know, she just kind of, I don't know. I could see in her eyes that she just kind of seemed like, you know, this wasn't the kind of thing that she was hoping for, you know, and I get it. You know, I think that, you know, we were all a little bit on cloud nine. We hadn't seen each other. We were all like locked up in hotel rooms and all of a sudden we get this moment and then we see these things from the past and it just all of a sudden changes the whole atmosphere of the room really quickly. And I don't think she was prepared for all of that. Um, and she just was like, what is this show? I mean, you know, the people that she knew that were producing the show when we did the show weren't, you know, weren't right there for her. And so mm. she's like, hmm, I don't know what these people are up to. All of a sudden, it just seems like if everyone's going to be fighting and arguing, I, I don't want to be a part of that, you know? So she did text me and we texted back and forth during the time of the show as we were completing oh. the show. And um, just to check in and she just was like, look, I, I'm just not interested in like that reality warfare conflict, <laughs> you know, constant conflict kind of thing. And it's like, you know, I'm over that. So I respect that. That's totally great. We were hoping she'd come back and, you know, she just really felt like, you know, she didn't trust the people shooting her. So I get it. Yeah, Eric, it, it was interesting when she had said something about she thought that she was coming into like some big chill. Let's look back at the past and hang out and have a good time. Not let's do it again. What did you think that you were going to walk into? I'm sorry. <laughs> the, <We're> unknown. <laughs> the unknown. So the you unknown. were kind I mean, of open to anything. That's Oh, of course. I mean, this is real. This is reality TV. I mean, you know, we've we created this thirty years ago. Right. <laughs> so, you know, look, enter TV and entertainment does not work without entertainment. There has to be some kind of drama, comedy, conflict, action. Some conflict. Something has to entertain the viewer. And no, even, you know, the conversations that we had with the producers before, I had a very uh, intense, lengthy conversation with the producers. And I said, you know, you guys need to know that if this is not authentic and you are not honoring and respecting us and you're not being completely transparent with how you're going to produce this, you're going to get kickback. You're yeah. going to get punched back. You're going to get fight back. And that happened in our very, in our first season, they started to manipulate um, the production to try to get a rise out of us to create more entertainment. And in Becky's defense, they threw a curveball at her. Mm. They were not uh, forthright and transparent with that part of of the show that they shared that clip they and revisit that fight let's that. do it again mm. absolutely there's no yeah. question in my mind they knew exactly what they were doing of course they're going to use that clip because look how prevalent racism and separation and division is right now with be with black lives matter and all of that's happened in the last four years and you know, that, that the presidency and everything and, mm -hmm. and everything that the media uses, the fear, and they just drive it day after day after day to create more separation and division. I mean, if you can't see that, you're not aware that that's actually being created and manipulated. You know, you need to seriously take a good look <laughs> at yourself um, because it's Mm -hmm. Very clearly. 
And yeah, so, yeah. you know, these production companies, they have to sit down at a round table and they have to come up with a plan on how are we going to get the most out of this? How are we going to entertain right. everybody? And that's where my hesitation has always come in to come back into that world because these producers and these people that run these networks, they can't control themselves. They love to be in a position of power and manipulation and control. That's why they're producers because they're creating and con controlling an experience to entertain people and they are not thinking about the hearts and the nervous system and the inner child and the sensitive beings that we are. It takes somebody with thick skin to play in this game because of that intention that comes from their own personal shortcomings and insecurities and judgments and fears. And you know, it took me many, you... many years to understand okay. this and see it. Yeah. It's interesting yeah. that you say that because Norman, you talked about mm -hmm. it in the show of how you kind of, you know, on one hand in the, in the original that mm -hmm. you felt you were being produced and then you kind of grabbed your mm -hmm. narrative and could, and produced yourself. Right. And really decided, how do I want to portray myself, not only as a person, but mm -hmm. knowing your place in history as a gay man? So did you go into this series with an agenda in terms of what you wanted to show? Um, I, I, I absolutely did. I mean, I think um, just leading up to it, you know, Eric had mentioned that we were on um, Andy Cohen's E Hollywood special and which that was a great opportunity for me to just kind of, you know, clarify. I mean, with millennials, they weren't even born at the time and they have a certain context of yeah. how the world works. And it wasn't just peachy key, wonderful. Everybody loves gay people, you know, like <laughs> we may, I mean, you know, like, you know, I mean, it's just, it wasn't the world in which we came from. And, um, and I'm sorry, we're, I'm going through like this extreme, um, weather is coming in there's like a tornado alert oh, and oh, like wow. literally like like we're gonna about we're being hit really hard and there's hail coming down so if you see oh me wiggling God, around and I'm to I'm Peru. freaking oh. out right now it's like i'm like what is going come, on there? come to even... peru norm <laughs> ah, if I, I point the camera i'm like there's hail coming down right now it's nuts <laughs> ah. Um, All right. Well, we hope you're okay. But if something's gonna go like a twister is gonna go through I your know, apartment, it, it looks if it could go it's, through yes. it on the show, we would go through it on the show. It. Look at that red. Please. It's about to hit us. That, oh my god! That, you are like, there. There's like a like a yeah. There's like a a tornado like, alert. <laughs> I'm like on my phone. I'm like, what? <laughs> I have to go to my basement. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got <laughs> the closet's not, lose the not big enough. I've got to go to the basement. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, well, I'll one of the things that I what I loved about uh, your narrative on this show was you really opened up about the financial problems you had about how am I going to get I mean, that we talked about the beginning mm. of the show, how am I going to get my stuff out of LA? I'm kind of homeless, I'm kind of at the end of my rope. Mm -hmm. And there was a really beautiful moment, which is all of your housemates said, what can we do? Yeah. And it's like, you're a great artist. Maybe you should create art again. Maybe you should be showing people. And suddenly everybody got together and you were doing these rabbits on yeah. on uh, uh, shopping were, bags. Yeah. And um, there were these individual rabbits and everybody was flooding social media saying, let's sell. If we can sell five more rabbits, we can get Norm stuff out of Janet Charlton's house. Yeah. And uh, so how did that? That must have really. I mean, I actually got a little tear in my eye because I thought it was such a beautiful moment that these people can put everything aside to help the one, like you were the lame mm. gazelle and everybody stopped to help you. I, I just, and it's so appreciative. And, and honestly, I just thought like, you know, this just sounds so cheesy to paint on camera, you know, and <laughs> uh, you know, that's so, uh, you know, me and my big art head, you know, coming from all these prestigious art schools and all these places. Um, but I am just so appreciative uh, of it. You know, I, 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 
I, I don't Twitter and all these things that you know Heather is really good at and and Kevin is good oh, at. Oh, she which, is a miracle. You worker. know, just a miracle worker. And they're like, look, you know, we're gonna, you know, all that stuff happened after our show. So you know, I have like I had like ten people follow me on like whatever Instagram <laughs> um, at the time, I'm and they're one like, of them. <laughs> thank you very much. You are so. I am because um, I love you. You know, that. and I just was like, I just I I don't know. I just thought it was completely kind of cheesy and I'm, I'm I, and, and it really has transformed so much I, I you know when the show aired and I was able to just kind of retool up the website I didn't expect the response that I had gotten of um you know people very interested in my work and you know in in me and and they've been very patient because I'm still working in a bakery and I'm just I've got this house that's you know under construction and um so yeah i've been able to make about 60 some rabbits since the show so oh, <laughs> a lot of people, rabbits and if people want to get one go to yep. normancorpy.com and all the but it's mostly on his social media but you know mm. you'll see all the links there eric you really opened up in your show about stuff that we had no idea you had been going through about um addiction issues, mental issues, body issues that none of us knew was going on because you always came off as, oh, you're the golden boy, the one that we all want to be. And it reminds us that even the golden boy has problems. <laughs> yeah, I, I wore the mask really well. You really did. And you re revealed on the show, you said, did you notice when I'd go out for a long period of time and wouldn't tell anyone where I was? Yeah, yeah, I did a pretty good job at, you know, hiding it from the public. Uh, but I mean, my family and my close friends were very much aware. Um, you know, I just you know, 30 years ago, I, I didn't understand what was happening. You know, so there really wasn't much to share at that point. Um, but, and do you, you know, think the last the 25 fame, years. I, I'm just wondering, did the fame yeah. help or did it magnify the problems? Because on one hand, fame give, and money and fame gives you access to help. On the other hand, it puts you under the microscope where you feel that you can't do anything. Yeah, and no, I was a little bit of both. Um, the real yeah. world uh, assisted me in looking at myself, um, observing my my behavior on the show and how I interacted with everybody on the show. <clears throat> um, it, it also uh, magnified um, the the suppressed emotions from the traumas in my childhood. Uh, you know, the drugs and the fame. And the women and the clubs and the partying and everything for free and, you know, having a lot of money. So uh, that definitely helped add fuel to, to the fire. But again, at the same time, uh, very short, not not long after the real world and the grind was when I met my my first teacher. So I was probably 20, 25 years old uh, when I met him and I lived with him for about seven years. And um, this, he was a very profound uh, um, eighth generation grandmaster from the Far East, uh, three different martial arts and Chinese medicine and meditation, Buddhism and all that. And so um, he started sharing with me uh, about, you know, who I am and why I'm here and, you know, my mission on this planet, where I came from and. He, he did this thing called the vibrational reading mm -hmm. uh, where he could touch your body and read the records of your soul. And so um, we had spent uh, time together in our past lives and came back together in this life to go through this process together. And, you know, he, he was the one that started the process of me you know, pulling out of those destructive behaviors. And did it, did you take to it immediately? Like, was it like, this is what I need? Or did you resist? Because I always think people, the master comes when the person is ready. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, yeah, of course, there was resistance. But, you know, the, the I mean, the training that I was doing with him was so intense. It was like the karate kid times 10. 
So, I, you know, I was training, you know, with this grandmaster from the Far East. And from the moment I woke up in the morning until the mm-hmm. moment that I went to sleep at night, I was training and, you know, doing something, building shelves, moving antiques, trimming bonsai trees, you know, doing thousands of kicks and punches every day. And so, I mean, it was incredibly challenging and exhausting. And, you know, I probably, I fell off at least three times, three or four times over seven years training with him. Um, but they were all life, life lessons and, and would catapult me into, you know, what I'm doing now. So yeah, well, I'm really what I grateful think my for question, all the experiences. My, my question is, though, something must have happened in your life that you were actually willing to do all that stuff because you don't just wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to just surrender. Or maybe you do. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, there's a lot of things that happened <laughs> in my life. You know, there were things that I was um, I was avoiding and I, I wasn't mm-hmm. willing to look at. But these were very traumatic uh, experiences that I had. I, mean, I, I was, you know, I lost my virginity. I was raped by a, a woman when I was 12, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you know, my first girlfriend cheated on me. Um, you know, so there was all these things that happened with women very early on in, in my life where I didn't trust them. And then right. later on, I would be molested by a man. And so, mm-hmm. you know, now I'm super confused and really lost. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about my relationship with my brother and and my father and stuff. So, you know, these are all um, traumas, you know, emotional traumas that I experienced that I didn't understand that I was suppressing in my body. I was holding them down in my body. And so when I met my grandmaster, um, things later on in my life, but it was when I went out on my own, I started doing long fasts and cleanses in the desert, um, you know, really wanting to understand you know, what was going on inside of me. And then it got even much more interesting with spirits that were attached to me and portals that I opened nine lifetimes ago. And all of these dark spirits had access to me and they were attaching themselves to me. And I had to close the portal and release all of these spirits I, I mean, I could go on and on and on. It's been a very challenging spiritual journey for the last, you know, 30 years since the real world. And that's where it all started because I was watching myself on this show, not really liking mm. what I was seeing about myself. And so I consciously made a choice. I, I, I wanted to change. I think that was the point, is that really mm-hmm. what was that thing that clicked for you? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Norm, it kind of makes mm-hmm. you lying in the tub seem a little bit inconsequential. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, <laughs> but it, it does remind us that we've TV got... history. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. So somebody actually, we've got all sorts of questions coming in. So somebody asked, hey, Billy, did you ever have fantasies about Norman or Eric just asking for a friend? Okay. Yes. The answer to that is yes. Because Norm was, you know, what Norm was for me, because we're all kind of the same age, is that um, Norm let me know that there was a place for me in the world. And let me see the possibilities of a gay man, which is incredibly appealing and attractive to peers. Yeah, I think that was amazing. amazing. And Eric... And when seeing his relationship with Eric also, because when you're a gay guy and during, what was this, Norman, 80s? In 92, but yeah, okay. uh, like long 90, a, a extended 80s. <laughs> yeah, so 92, but the, you know, it, it, back then, gay people were much more marginalized. I don't think children realize this. And to see... Norman as a typical gay male with Eric, who you might think to look at him was like the big hetero guy you should be afraid of that might beat you up. And Mm -hmm. to see how beautifully they got along made both of them so gorgeous in terms of people. 
And yeah, I mean, you know, wanted to sleep with both of them, sure, I mean, if that's the question. But um, so, um, and, and Norman, did you kind of look at it that, that way as well? Was it, were you aware what you were presenting to young gay men around the world? Uh, yes, that was definitely something pretty conscious of me. You know, I, I'd been part of like, the, almost the beginnings of like ACT UP and a lot of different groups. And mm. we had gone through um, a really tragic, you know, and we were in the middle of an AIDS epidemic and, and our visibility and how people related to us or who would even talk to us. I mean, I mean, like glad was like two little folding chairs in a room <laughs> somewhere, you know, there was no one was, they'd hang the phone up on them. Like what, what are you talking about? Gay people in the media click goodbye. That was that, you know, I mean, there was no access to nothing. And yeah, right. so this was such an incredible opportunity to show people here are these very diverse allies, you know, as they've become and how they could relate to someone like me. And, and that being recorded and seen was almost like a, a vision for people. They're like, look, they could point somewhere and say, look, if those seven people can all enjoy themselves and, and be on adventures and, and appreciate one another and have laughs and, 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 and their lives are going to go somewhere, you know, then I want to be part of that universe. And I think that was really important. And I was very fortunate and, and very conscious that that's the kind of train I wanted to drive. I did not want to drive a train of controversy. And I could have easily. I mean, I could have really oh, you just could have been the bitchy. Queen. I mean, I could have came, I could have came right in there and just like and but for people never to have a context for that like was not the place I, I i was trying to think of a bigger audience you know um well we have a question for eric grant has sent it now three times so grant i'm getting to it okay eric this is going to you now nana needs her glasses okay a question for eric i see you practice and study holistic health do you have any advice or tips for sleep apnea any advice would be appreciated remember you from your mtv days thank you and god bless eric sleep apnea yeah they perhaps want to look at uh, something that maybe when they were a child where they had an experience while they were sleeping where they they oh, were trauma. scared or they didn't feel safe a trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and any issue, any psychological, emotional, <laughs> and physical issue, in my opinion, based off of my personal experiences, is all uh, related to suppressed emotions from traumas in our life. Mm -hmm. un un unresolved, unresolved emotional experiences that we have with other people. Um, so they might want to take a look at w when they were a child. Um, if there's something that was happening with them when they were a child while they were sleeping. So the reason why they would have sleep apnea is because the soul is trying to inform him, Grant. Yes, his name's Grant? Grant, yes. Yep, Grant. Yeah, Grant. So because you have sleep apnea because your soul and your inner child is, is trying to remind you that something happened while you were sleeping when you were a child Got he it. might it might even come up right now like just by me saying oh. that it will it'll create Trigger like a it. vision or a memory or a thought about mm -hmm. something that happened and if you'll know if it's true if you get emotional grant if you start to get emotional about remembering that experience then you'll know that that's what your sleep apnea is attached to Okay. Uh, Paul has a question. Paul says, all conversations about minorities speak of them as a group and not as individual souls. You know, we didn't talk about Julie. And, you know, we talk about minorities in terms of gay people, black people, any minorities. Julie came into the show, I thought, the original show, as like the biggest fish out of water and kind of the person that you know, he probably speaks very poorly of me that I thought to myself, oh, she's going to be the Southern hick who's going to be prejudiced and who's going to be, you know, saying things that are going to piss people off. And yet, you both had very, diff very specific relationships with Julie. Eric, um, you kind of were thrust together immediately. Was it something that 
you were attracted to each other in terms of as people or was it that you were like the two people who needed each other what was it about you and julie well you know julie was her first time in new york city and she didn't know anybody or anything and i had been there for years um not many years but i've been living in new york i think probably for about three years um you know i i knew new york like the back of my hand by that time um and you know she was like a like a sister to me you know we were living together we're in the same place i mean it's almost like human nature you know i i cared about her um you know i wanted her to have an amazing experience in new york and you know, i wanted to connect with her so it was just a, a natural i just think it was a natural connection it wasn't anything romantic or, or anything like that um I just wanted her to feel safe in New York and, and make sure that she was okay. Norman, you, you really, it seemed to me in the original show that uh, you kind of waited for her to open up to you, that you really were very sensitive of the fact that she was new to all this and kind of seeing, well, what is her reaction going to be to a gay man? And yet she was very positive and I, I don't know. Maybe you didn't think like I did, but that kind of surprised me. Yeah, and, and it comes back to your earlier question about being somewhat conscious and um, sensitive to like what I was bringing to the table, and you know, I really wanted to, you know, and as a question that was brought brought in about in, individuals or group thinking, and um, and this is where I wanted everybody in the house to see me as an individual, you know, before bringing in this bigger group dynamic of a gay community and, and what it was to be gay and um, into the house. And I just wanted to let people know me as a person and who I was, you know, um, before I was being judged because it's so easy to, you, you figure out, okay, you're part of that group, you know, you're part of a gay community, whatever it's been framed in people's minds, you know, once they kind of got to understand you as an individual. Did you, um, did could, you look at her from the South? Did you have preconceived notions of, Oh, this girl's not going to know anything or she's going to be a hick or whatever. Or did you go? I am from the upper peninsula openness? of Michigan. I'm from the upper well. peninsula of Michigan. Come on. We, <laughs> I so mean, you we're called, we, you, you know, the, the whole you. hillbilly thing. I mean, forget it. We're called jeeters. It's like hillbillies on steroids <laughs> up here. Youpers. It's a whole other thing, you know, I mean, we've got certain, you know, torch songs of like, you know, Santa Claus coming in his broken down, like Chevy, you know, it was like a whole, yeah. It's like, yeah, no, I speak that so you were so you were as open to mm -hmm. everybody as you wanted them to be open to you basically yes yeah did did either of you was there any who was the person to each of you that was the hardest nut to crack when you first got into the house initially um norman who was the you know maybe had some walls up or that you didn't connect with immediately I, you know, I would think Kevin, I mean, I mean, he was, he definitely was a good listener. I could see he was observing. Um, I think we even counted the days that he spent in the loft. And I think seven was the amount of days that he actually spent overnight in the loft of the entire time. Really? So that of course made it a lot more difficult. And, you know, when he was a little bit older and had a, you know, his, he was teaching at NYU and, you know, for us, you know, everything was kind of young and we were just kind of getting out of college and we were just getting our first jobs and we we're doing a lot of interesting things in New York. So, um, and it, you know, here we are with these MTV cameras. So we were bringing a lot of excitement to it where he had more of a professional job and needed to kind of be somewhere and, you know, people, you know, needed his knowledge, you know, and reliable. So mm -hmm. I think, um, I think, you know, so that I, I, didn't get to know Kevin as much um, in, in during the season when we shot it. How about you, Eric? Was there anybody that you that you had to put a little bit more effort into to connect with initially? Uh, I think that would be Andre. Yeah. Really. Any mm -hmm. particular reason? He always seemed very quiet and introspective to me. 
Um, I just think that Andre and I were just in two totally different worlds at that time. I mean, I was like rollerblading and going to clubs and dancing and just, you know, just out with my friends and, you know, wanting to have a good time and like modeling and commercials and all that stuff. <laughs> and that was just not Andre's world. You know, he was just, he's a rock star and yeah. you know, he had his band and his crew and there, there just really wasn't much to talk about then, but now it's completely different. You know, I, I really enjoy talking to Andre now. And um, that, that was one of the, kind of the regrets I had, you know, like, I mean, we've all stayed in contact hmm. a little bit, you know, here and there. Uh, but I, I really missed out on the opportunity of, of, of spending that week really getting an opportunity to communicate, you know, with each other and, you know, see where everybody's really at and hear about their family life and their children and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, but it's probably Andre. Yeah, I think that when I was watching it, again, I realized watching this reunion series that I probably knew the least about Andre. And it didn't really hit me until mm -hmm. watching it and then going back and re-watching the first season to just sort of see what I remembered and if I remembered it accurately, that Andre always was a little bit of an enigma to me. Whereas I, I was staggered to see where Julie is now in her life and her kids and how she's raising them. And that I thought to myself, this little girl that mm -hmm. I first saw that I thought mm -hmm. to myself was sort of the most innocent and wide eyed of the bunch took everything she has learned in the past 28 years and is paying it forward with a new generation of warriors. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. Impressive. There's no doubt about it. She's an yeah. incredible mother, incredible friend. She's in super thoughtful and empathetic and compassionate. She's mm -hmm. in service to her community. I, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't really say enough about Julie. And she's always been like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow. that reminds and me of when, yes. when, when she went. So when when julie went to go spend time with that homeless woman uptown mm -hmm. yep like that's julie's heart that mm -hmm. is <laughs> if, if there's a big picture you know mm -hmm. of julie um you know that says it all right there because she mm -hmm. genuinely wanted to spend time with her and understand her life and where she came from why she was there what did she need anything Mm -hmm. um, and, she, and she's always been like that. And today that's what she gives to her family and her children, to her community. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. Amazing, amazing mm -hmm. woman. Well, and on the flip yeah. side, she also would go off with a biker. So, you know, that was also Julie. Because right. I sat there and said, who is the one person <laughs> on the real world who might not get on the back of a strange man's bike? Julie. And who did it? So that that's fascinating <laughs> to me. But we haven't talked about, so the one person we haven't talked about is Heather. And Norman, I loved <laughs> watching you and Heather on this new series. Yeah. Because you really <laughs> seem to connect the most. And I don't know if that surprised you as much as it surprised me. Uh, yeah, Heather and I are thick as thieves. We've always been this way. I mean, I don't know wow. if you get a chance that <laughs> I did that um, wedding video movie. Did you ever get a chance that, that I did? long time ago it was like 2000 oh. i did it was like a mockumentary of a gay wedding and it oh. had all ex real world people and heather b is really the star and i edited it all around her but we were very close and i just felt like her talent is limitless i mean the and this is before she was on the her radio that she's on serious and um her radio her podcast oh, her, her podcast book. I mean, there's just, just so just much constantly. talent just so much talent yes and so I, I, you know, I, I came up with this crazy idea. We brought it up to Sundance, all that good stuff. And um, Heather was just a knockout star. And I then went after that to try to make another film, a follow-up film with her and all of these rap artists and stuff. And just, I just was just enamored, like how incredibly, incredibly talented she was. And I'm so appreciative that people have found 
her because you know she was a breakthrough person i mean people that were like that you know i mean she is very dark black and she is just like she's not like a typical person that you would see when you wouldn't normally see people of her body type or anything like this on television i mean she really broke that and she is everyone loves her i mean when you go on the show when you go to a radio show and everyone just she's such a force a talent and she's just also very generous and kind and um She's always doing charities for people and um, just funny is, you know, you'd think you'd be scared, you know, to death from her. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, she's like this gangster rapper coming my way and oh, you're <laughs> listening to her albums. I mean, what is happening? And she is just, you know, but um, we laugh a lot and which is, which is super great. So um, we've always been pretty bonded um she's always an i know my love the gays she's always like you know take me out with the gays and she's <laughs> and even with the show a lot of the stuff that you wouldn't see i mean i would take you know i was i was very i'm very close friends with like rupaul and lady bunny and and linda simpson and a lot of people that ran the pyramid um mm -hmm. and that's pretty much was my like second home oh. and a lot of that stuff never made it on the on this show we did go film there and they did come to my birthday party and they, you know, but like drag queens on television back then were a oh, whole big no no. It was bad enough I was showing up. So, <laughs> and so you really didn't get to see the caliber of my friends. But Heather was front and center every time that we would go any of these places and loved them up. You know, just loved them all up. She said, Norm, I just love the guys. I love them. <laughs> I loved watching this series, Eric, because whenever you came on the screen, Heather seems to be as nurturing as you are she was always you know how are you doing what are you doing how are you feeling do this do that she really seems to be very much like a mother hen which is kind of how you are yeah she's my mama bear and i'm her boo <laughs> was that something you both had in common the first time around or have you grown into those roles yeah, we we always had this kind of playful banter <laughs> with each other. Um, I I love Heather, and I was you know a, attracted to her spirit. You know, from the moment mm -hmm. I walked in the loft, and um, uh, there, and I think that you know we mutually respect each other, and you know, where we're, where we're both at in each other's lives. And we, we love to joke around and play with each other and flirt with each other. And yeah, it's just like two cute little kids, like, you know, having fun in the park. And it's always been like that, you know, even in the first show when we were like, you know, wrestling and she says, I just want to choke Eric. You know, like to <laughs> me, that was funny you know, because I get it, you know, I like, like I get it. Um, but the beauty of it is that we'll, we'll, well, and it's not just with Heather and I, it's the whole group. We, we mm -hmm. will always try to find a way to communicate with each other, to listen to each other, to understand each other. And I think that we all understand the potential uh, inspiration and impact that we can have uh, on, on other people you know, mm -hmm. having this platform. So I think we, we all take it very seriously. Um, yeah. And we do our, 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 our best to take responsibility and, you know, be good people. Yeah, I found it really interesting, you know, that when there was the fight between Becky and Kevin, Heather really kind of took herself out of it. And it's like, I'm not going to be the angry black woman. I'm not going to be the woman. I'm not going to be part of this. And I'm just going to step back and you all do what you're going to do. I'm listen. cutting up vegetables <laughs> and listen. She's good. She's good at listening. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we all need? I mean, the last thing that mm -hmm. we want is like unsolicited advice from, from people projecting, you know, their own issues onto each other. We just <laughs> we really need a strong community of listeners. You know, just let's listen to what people are feeling. You know, it's because it's, it's so difficult for a lot of people to, to be vulnerable and share. And then, mm. you know, once you break through the fear, you know, and that self judgment of being vulnerable in sharing, and then you're like sitting across from somebody that just wants to like 
give you advice, give you advice, give you like, like try to fix you, try to fix you. When really the person's just asking for you to listen. I just need somebody to listen to what I'm feeling. And Heather's really good at that. Yeah. It was really obvious. Um, I'm curious now the show's over and when you came out of the show, Norman, I'll ask you because you were in the house, what effect now we're still kind of in a pandemic so what mm -hmm. effect did this series have on your life in the aftermath well i mean just the evidence that's in in this room as far as like you know re jump starting my career again you know exactly you know here i am and um just painting away so that is has been an incredible gift um you did know, you find the love of art again did you reconnect with that love you know, it's that's always been there. I'm, you know, whether people are going to support me or not, I can't not put things together and make something. I'm just that's how I am. I'm always looking under this, going over here, photographing, trying to figure things out. So, um, you know, I figured I'm only here for another so many years. I'm just going to leave as many little pieces of norm graffiti as I best can. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so, I, and then I'm very isolated here. It's very remote. I mean, I guess my basement is flooding because I'm getting text from my roommate. <laughs> He's like, um, there is a foot of water in the basement. So I'm, I need to kind of go down there and Where check that it out. Yeah. yeah um, and so <laughs> there's only about, mm, I don't know, the town's like a thousand people. And the nearest airport is three hour drive. So it's, it's super, super remote. It's on Lake Superior and um it's beautiful so, you're so not i really getting all no, of that i don't even know the, like... no people at the average age is like 72 here um <laughs> and seriously it is and so um no one yeah and i'm related to all of them anyway so no one you know <laughs> so who are you sleeping with uh myself and i was going to say for sleep apnea get rid of your partner and it goes away Exactly. <laughs> Eric, Eric, how, how has the aftermath of the show been for you? Because it seemed to me you and I were texting when the show was going on and you got, and you were sort of out of the country pretty quickly. Well, yeah, I, I was already planning when the pandemic hit, I had a plan to come down to Peru for, for a couple of months um, and then everything shut down. So as soon as it opened, I, I came down to Peru. So that was been my focus all along. So the real world re uh, homecoming really has not affected your life. You're back to where you were right before the, the show started. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hasn't, um, hasn't had a negative or positive impact at all. Uh, okay. Well, I just want to thank both of you because I think that, the if if the for me the biggest thing that came out of this new series was it put a little snapshot on where we were and where we are and the things that people can remain the same in a world that's always changing and grow and if the if you guys can get together and listen to each other then maybe the rest of the world can i don't know yeah hope hopefully so. Hopefully, uh, that would be I know, but I, I would, I just want to remind people that Eric's website, I am Eric Nies, uh, is, um, you can find out about his Peruvian, uh, uh, retreats and everything going on with him. And of course, Norman Corpy is normancorpy.com. They're also both on social media and buy a, buy a bunny. If you're, if you really are sitting there wondering, what can I do? <laughs> buy a bunny. He's got lots of bunnies for sale. He can, get his, he can get his stuff out of Janet Charlton's house. And, um, you know, Janet needs space for more gloves. So, guys, thank you so much for doing this. I know yes, we've gone you. back and forth for so many months. Yeah. And I really appreciate it because it, I, think it's, I think what you've both done with your lives have been really important. I think you've helped a lot of people. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Norman. You very much, thank Billy. you, Eric. Um, I will you, talk to you both later. 
And, uh, and right. you know, if you can stay for a second, I'll say goodbye to you after we wrap, but let me just wrap. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of both of you. Thank you, everybody, for watching Billy Masters Live. I have been, of course, Billy Masters. We will not be here next week because I'm on vacation. Have a safe Fourth of July. Get out there. Have a good time. But be safe and be kind to each other. And just remember that if they can get along in the real world, then we can get along in the real world. We'll talk to you later. And just remember, if we're here, we're live. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.